Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Beryl Miles. I think I know most of the people in the room. I'm the dean at Catholic University of America's Columbus School of Law. And today's program is entitled Innovative Approaches to Advancing Corporate Morality. And this is the third program in a series that we have been uh, able to host here at the National Press Club entitled Critical Insights in the Law and Law Practice, Ethical and Moral Responsibility. I think the topic of today's program couldn't be more timely. We are continually seeing uh, corporate actions that um, implicate moral and ethical dimensions. I think probably the one that we've been focusing on the most uh, is what's going on with Toyota and what prompted them to finally make the decision uh, to have the recall of hundreds of thousands of automobiles. Was it immoral? or an ethical question, or was it simply an expedient decision on their part? I was told about another story involving a corporation, and this one goes back to around about Christmas of 1995, involving the Malden Mills factory in Lawrence, Massachusetts. Burned to the ground. The CEO had to rebuild, but his decision was to continue to pay his employees at full salary while that was going on. Today, the company is thriving. Was that CEO's decision one of altruism or canny business investment in the future? Now, we're not here to judge a single corporation or any corporate action. In a moral sense, of course, corporations are like people. They're made up of people capable of great Greatness, pettiness, capable of generosity, selfishness. We know that corporations can yield an extraordinary amount of economic as well as political power in the communities that we live in, in our nation, and even throughout the world. And I think the discussion here is going to ask us, think about asking them, should they be held to a higher standard. Today's program is being brought to you by our Law and Public Policy Program, and it is being presented by its director, Professor Sarah Duggan, and our colleague, distinguished lecturer, Professor Stephen Goldman. They have both worked extremely hard to bring this to you today, and we have a wonderful and outstanding group of individuals who will serve as our panelists. I'm very grateful to them for their efforts. By sponsoring a series that focuses on ethical and moral issues in the practice of law, we like to think that we're contributing to a very important consideration. We're looking at the questions that ultimately are important to us having a very just and fair society. In April, we will have another program, and that will be the final one of this four-part series for our academic year. I hope you will join us for that. It is entitled, Philanthropy in the 21st Century, Should All Charities Be Created Equal? I hope that you will join us for that program as well. And now I'm going to ask Professor Duggan to say a few words. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Dean Miles. And good afternoon, and thanks to all of you for joining us here. Our panel, who uh, had to fly through some threatening storms, and all of you who bla uh, braved those high winds out there, thanks for coming. As Dean Miles pointed out, corporations can be forces for good or ill in the world. When we look around us, one thing we can't escape is that more than half of the world's largest 150 economies are not countries, but corporations. And size is only one indication of the power of corporate entities. The corporate form is the most powerful wealth pooling engine ever devised. And businesses, unlike nation states, are rarely restricted by the politics of geography, ethnicity, or religious differences. As economic actors, corporations cross borders and forge multicultural alliances far more successfully than governments. And when we think about government functions and many of the powers that governments have, 
for example, to compel children to become educated, to operate and incarcerate prison systems and incarcerate prisoners, to go to war. In our society, all of these things might well be impossible without corporations. Corporations that sometimes run schools and operate prison systems. Corporations that even provide the services necessary to wage war in the modern era. And as the United States Supreme Court's recent decision in Citizens United versus the Federal Election Commission underscores, as artificial persons, corporations, US corporations, possess many of the same rights as living, breathing human beings. In short, in local, national, and global arenas, corporations today enjoy unparalleled power and influence. Now this reality has many positive aspects. Business corporations produce the goods and services that give each one of us a safer, more comfortable life than anyone has had in most of history. And businesses have responded to the needs of communities from Main Street to the post-Katrina New Orleans to Port-au-Prince after the Haitian earthquake. Unfortunately, however, market pressures often override basic humanity. And a single-minded focus on profit maximization, as we've seen in many different ways, can wreak havoc with global systems and can create a great deal of human suffering. In fact, the impact of the corporate race to the bottom is very real for many workers and their families, both in the United States and around the world. And far too many people live amid environmental devastation caused by the mindless exploitation of natural resources. I think we're all still reeling from the financial crisis, and there's some of us here who get a bit worried about stepping on the gas pedals in their cars, if you, like I do, drive a Toyota. So corporations exert this kind of power, and as Dean Miles pointed out, we need to ask, how do we encourage them to be forces for good? How do corporations help us and help others figure out their role in society? So today we're here to talk about corporate social responsibility, CSR shorthand. There are myriad definitions of CSR, but this afternoon, we're going to focus on voluntary actions undertaken by business corporations with a view toward the well-being of a wide range of constituents, certainly including their shareholders, but also workers, consumers, and communities. And we have some questions that you'll hear from the panel today, including what can we learn from businesses that make a habit of corporate social responsibility? Does doing good lead to doing well? How do the interests of workers and other constituents stack up against the now deeply ingrained notion that the only legitimate responsibility of business managers is to maximize profits? Is it about time to rethink our notion of corporations as purely economic actors? And finally, what is corporate morality? Is there a place for the pursuit of goodness as well as the pursuit of profits? These are just some of the questions our panelists are going to be talking about this afternoon. And now my colleague Steve Goldman will introduce our speakers. Each speaker will present a brief opening statement. We'll have follow that with some panel discussion, and then we'll have time for audience questions and comments. I hope you enjoy the program, and thanks again for coming. Welcome, everybody. Let me add my thanks for you uh, coming today to discuss this topic of um, such extreme importance to the well-being of the world in which we live. It's my privilege to introduce uh, our speakers today. To my immediate left is Lyman P. Q. Johnson, who is Robert O. Bentley Professor of Law at the Washington, Lee, Washington and Lee School of Law 
and also Lejeune Distinguished Professor of Law at the St. Thomas Law School uh, in Minnesota. He is a frequent consultant and expert witness on complex business issues, and he has written extensively in the field of corporate law and accountability. To Lyman's left is Carolyn Berkowitz. Uh, Carolyn is Vice President of Community Affairs of Capital One Financial Group and President of Capital One Foundation. She is also a volunteer, a volunteer member of several boards, including the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, U.S. Chamber of Commerce's Business and Civic Leadership Center, the Washington Area Women's Foundation, and the Jewish Social Services uh, Agency. To her left is uh, Professor David Vogel, who is Simon P. Lee Professor of Business Ethics at the Haas School of Business at the University of California uh, in Berkeley. And uh, he is the author of the award-winning book, The Market for Virtue, The Potential and Limits of Corporate Social Responsibility, uh, published by Brookings in 2005. And uh, uh, it's a, uh, I'm very happy to have uh, Professor Vogel talk about this. It is uh, a compelling uh, read that uh, uh, he has. Finally, at the end of the table is Damon Silvers, who is Director of uh, Policy and Special Counsel for the AFL-CIOs, for the AFL-CIO. He's Deputy Chair of the Congressional Oversight Panel of TARP and Chair of the Competition Subcommittee of the U.S. Treasury Department's Advisory Committee on the Auditing Profession. So we have a wide range of speakers today and uh, we hope you'll find the, discuss the discussion stimulating. Damon, we turn to you and uh, ask, what are the critical elements of corporate social responsibility from the perspective of workers and other non-shareholder constituents? My answer to that may be a little, a little, uh, may seem a little odd. Um, you know, we at the AFL-CIO often get requests uh, from a variety of places um, as to who do we think or which do we think are the most socially responsible companies uh, in America or in the world, whatever. And we never, we refuse to answer that question. We, 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 never, we won't answer that question. Not because of some deep uh, analytical or ideological thing, but because of experience. And what our experience is is that if you answer that question, you will get embarrassed. Um, that um, that uh, uh, the today's socially responsible company uh, is tomorrow humans, hum, tomorrow's human rights violator. Uh, that uh, really there is, there's just no such thing as a socially responsible company. Uh, there are socially responsible acts, uh, but there's no. This is not a, an adjective that describes an institu a, a, a business, a for-profit business. It just doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, it doesn't attach. Uh, and, 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 and like I said, it gets very embarrassing if you, if you uh, try to make it attach. Um, now, what's, what's sort of the deep, uh, the deep uh, piece behind that? And I'll say that you know, uh, 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 working people uh, are, uh, you know, are, are, are obviously employees of companies, uh, corporations often, uh, are uh, increasingly uh, owners in various ways and creditors, uh, uh, have interests in communities and so forth of the type. Uh, 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 that Carolyn was talking about. Uh, so we sort of there's a lot of different angles that we uh, look at this from. Now, and in certain respects, I would say that in in, a, in many ways my job is done. The the, the the typology that Carolyn laid out, things that companies do because they have to, things that are done uh, have to meaning compelled by regulation or law, uh, or or something close to regulation and law. And I want to come back to that for a second. The expected, meaning the things that are social, that, that, that you know, you do if you're, uh, you do not to be embarrassed. Um, although, you know, if, if you didn't do them, no one, no one could, could compel you maybe, but you know, you do them because that's sort of the minimum expected by decent society. And then the strategic. Uh, our, our, good, our good set of typology, it's a good typology to keep in mind. But, um, I want to come back and sort of push on the notion of that this is really sort of the null set, that there isn't really such a thing as, as corporate social responsibility. Uh, you know, corporations, uh, the Supreme Court may not understand this. I think actually they profoundly don't. 
Uh, but corporations are not persons, uh, just as Dred Scott was a person, a corporation is not a person. Uh, and uh, what they are are uh, legal structures designed to make money. Uh, and uh, it's, best, it's a good thing to keep that in mind. Uh, and there are two kinds of things that corporations do in, that then get confused as being about being socially responsible or being moral. Uh, and the first thing that they do uh, is, is that they make smart business decisions based on a deep understanding of the markets that they actually inhabit and the, consti and the constituencies they have to mobilize in order to make money. Uh, now, uh, an awful lot, and I think this is more or less uh, the, the, what Karen was talking about when she described the example of the bank in Cypress Hills and the, and the approach that was taken to that bank. It's why, you know, uh, uh, you don't want to pay your skilled mechanics minimum wage. Uh, you know, and, and my, most people don't. Uh, uh, there, there, there's an example of a coal company uh, recent, during the, the boom in the energy prices that, that paid so little uh, that once energy prices boomed and other coal companies started operating, they literally couldn't get the coal out of the ground. Uh, and, and so they, their stock price went, went, that, you know, went very low uh, at a time when everything else was booming. So there are some people who are so stupid that they can't figure these things out. But, but fundamentally, an awful lot of what is social, is, goes by the term of social responsibility has little to do with morality. Uh, it has everything to do with being smart. Uh, and so it's not, in that respect, I think, very interesting. Uh, although it's very important in terms of what makes our society function. The, the, the next issue is this question of they, they make us do it. All right? Now, the, the corporate social responsibility that really is, it comes out of the they make us do it can be divided into two different realms. One is, that they make, one is the Community Reinvestment Act kind of they make us do it. There's a law. It gets enforced, private action, regulation, uh, uh, government enforcement. That's pretty straightforward. Nobody really thinks that that's corporate social responsibility. But there's another type of they make us do it that is really important to pay attention to. And, and, uh, and it's the decline of this kind of they make us do it that I think is responsible for a lot of what is wrong in our society uh, that is often sort of laid on the, on the shoulders of corporations. Um, give you an example coming out of the labor context. It was, le it was legal, starting in the late 1930s, to fire workers for striking. Uh, there's a case, uh, I think it's McKay Radio, but there are people in, the, in, this, in this hall who know it better than I, uh, uh, even though the title I have, uh, it's not actually my expertise. Uh, there's a case, Supreme Court case, says you can fire your workers for striking. Uh, no one did it. Uh, no one did it in any sense in the private sector for 40 years following that case. It's also true that the basic laws governing executive compensation have not changed in any meaningful way from the time in the 1950s when the typical corporate CEO was paid 24 times the average worker to today when the typical corporate CEO, depending on how you count, is paid somewhere between three and 500 times the average worker. No laws changed. But I represent to you that, the, that, that, the re, that, 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 not, that neither has any morality changed. People aren't any less greedy today than they were then. The people who ran America's large business corporations in 1950 would have, I think, been thrilled to have been paid, say, $100 million a year. But they knew what the consequences of trying to, of doing that would have been in the context of all the they, they made us do it of the American economy and society in 1950. Um, you know, if, they had, if a company had done such a thing at that time, a public corporation, uh, it would have been visited in swift succession uh, by the IRS, uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, the, uh, um, uh, the major radio and TV networks, uh, and all, they would have all basically ask the same question, how dare you do that? That's just utterly unacceptable. Uh, and, um, you know, its government contracts would probably have evaporated, a whole bunch of things would have happened, none of which would have been dictated by law, and people knew it at the time. So the decline of the balance of power between what corporations are built to do and the larger social structures uh, that, uh, mitigate, uh, that mitigate the socially harmful aspects of what corporations are built to do. The decline of that balance of power right, is critical to the, the, to the, to the shortage of, corporate, of, quote, socially responsible behavior by corporations. And then, the, and, and finally, I'm going to end with, with, I think, maybe where uh, our dean and, our, and, our introdu and the people who introduced uh, this program uh, wanted us to focus on, which is the element of real morality. Because everything I just described a moment ago is not morality. 
Right? It's, it's hard, it's, it's really tough calculations about how you function uh, in a commercial society. When I, uh, when I went, to, I went to business school, and the first day of business school, they had us do a four hour business ethics seminar. It was ungraded, unlike the rest of business school, uh, which maybe was a sign of something. And, and, the, uh, and the question that was posed to the class, this was 1993, and the question that was posed to the class was, uh, you're going to reload, you're, gonna sh you're, being at your, you're at and t and you have a, a manufacturing plant uh, in the United States, uh, it's a unionized plant, um, your consultants say shut it down and move it somewhere else. Uh, and here's a set of choices about this somewhere else. There's another place in the United States. Uh, there's a, uh, I think one of the locations in Singapore. Uh, and then there's a location in Maquilador in Mexico. And um, it's, it's hypothesized that the basic notion of going to the Maquilador is you get much higher, low, much lower per unit cost, but you will be implicated uh, in the most horrible sorts of toxic waste dumping and child labor and all kinds of really ugly things. Not you might be or whatever, you will be. So, so what choice should you make? And you know, it's, the choice was structured in terms of there's you know, different costs per unit of production in different plants and, and different levels of morally queasy behavior associated with each one. And so the class immediately divided. And basically all of the Americans in the class said, well, you just have to go to the lowest unit cost. That's what your fiduciary duty is. And all of the Europeans said, well, that's crazy. If you go to the lowest unit cost, you're going to get embarrassed and you might have legal actions and all this kind of thing. You probably get a poor quality product. Why don't you go someplace where they actually, you know, you have grown-ups working in the factory and, and you're not uh, poisoning the world because it's going to become, because, because the, the low unit cost is an illusion. That was the division. Nobody, nobody, not, no student and not the teacher, who's a famous ethicist, by the way, raised the question of whether or not you, there were some things you could not do regardless of what the, what the ultimate economic impact would be taking all things into consideration and being very smart, smart and strategic as Carolyn was describing. The fact that that question never gets asked, the idea that there are some things outside of economic calculus is a really troubling question. And and it is, and I would suggest that while it's a very troubling question and very important to all of us personally, that we, that we remember that that, that that question sits out there somewhere in the back of everything, that it has almost nothing to do with law and social policy. Because although we all think that there are limits beyond which we won't go, that corporations as institutions push in the direction of profit maximization, whether smartly or stupidly, intelligently or strategically. And in most cases, absent the kinds of social constraints I've described earlier, right, that still small voice that says, I won't go there, in most cases, not all, will be overwhelmed. Thank you. Uh, turning now to David, is there a business case for corporate social responsibility and what are the implications of how we answer that question? Thank you. Um, I think the, the key question is uh, not is there a business case for corporate responsibility, but what is the relative importance of the business case for corporate responsibility? Now, the notion that uh, one can do, um, one can do uh, well by doing good and doing good by doing well, um, that the market rewards virtue and punishes vice, uh, that the world is filled with opportunities, for companies to be both prosperous um, and responsible, they need not make trade-offs. This is a very attractive vision of the world. Imagine a world, for example, in which more virtuous and more responsible companies are rewarded in the marketplace and become increasingly successful. Less virtuous, less responsible firms are punished in the marketplace. They become less successful. They disappear. And to us, we have a wonderful world of increasingly responsible corporations. This world, however, uh, does not seem to be any closer uh, than when people suggested it was a possibility many years ago. Um, and the question is, um, is why? And I think the reason why is that at the end of the day, um, the, the business case for corporate responsibility, although very seductive, very attractive, very widely shared, and very hoped for, is in fact extremely weak. One way of thinking about this is to look at the company and disentangle this and say, what does a company need to survive? 
Well, to survive, a company needs to attract consumers, customers. A, B, for, for a survive, a company needs to attract capital, investors. C, for a company to survive, it needs to attract employees. These are the three markets in which every firm exists and which every firm must compete successfully to survive. What is the relative importance of corporate responsibility in each of these markets? And I would say, if you look carefully, it's pretty modest. Consumers, do consumers care about how responsible a company is? Well, surveys say they do, but if you look at people's behavior, it's overwhelmingly dictated by price, convenience, quality, other personal material considerations, not broader concerns about corporate responsibility. Um, if there was, in fact, a market for virtue, if consumers actually cared and rewarded more responsible firms and punished less responsible firms, uh, companies would behave much more responsibly than they do. But in fact, uh, most consumers are simply indifferent. The second are investors. How about investors? Well, there are social investors, there are um, socially responsible funds, there's a minority of investors who care about corporate social performance, but their relative impact on the capital markets is extremely modest. When I was writing my book on corporate responsibility, um, I did a very masochistic thing. I took out a year's subscription to um, Investor Daily, um, the, the, uh, the, the newspaper that comes out every day that's for investors to tell you about what to buy and sell. And I read uh, the headlines of every article and every page for an entire year, looking for one single reference where someone said, you know, this is a company that looks like it's being a responsible sell. This is a company that looks like it's responsible by, et cetera. One single story which talked about, which tells investors information about corporate responsibility to help inform their investment decisions. And there was not one such story. And if you want to just check this, you know, go on Yahoo or any investor site, okay? Click on any random company. Look at all the stock analysts and all the investors who give advice about it's a good buy, bad buy, though it's going to go up, down, et cetera. And see, look at the content of their, of their advice and see how often it ever mentions anything to do with corporate social responsibility. The answer you will find, I think, that it's extremely rare. It's simply below the radar screen. How about employees? Well, again, if you ask employees, they say they care. You ask business students, they really want to work for a responsible company, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, again, lots of noise. Um, we have these business school students now signing these oaths, promising to only work for responsible firms, et cetera. Um, if you look at actually behavior um, of, of, um, of MBAs, uh, uh, there are many factors which govern where people work, how morale, the morale of employees, et cetera. Wages matter, compensation matters, advancement matters, location matters. Lots of factors go into affecting employee morale. Um, is corporate responsibility one of them? Well, yeah, at the margin. Uh, it probably makes some people feel a little better, a little better off. Um, is it going to attract someone to work for X company rather than Y company? Um, I think unlikely, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so those three markets, I think, sort of don't, don't work. Now, another way of thinking about this, imagine a grid of four boxes, responsible, irresponsible, profitable, not profitable, okay, four boxes. And imagine you put all companies into one of those four boxes. Now, would you find examples of responsible and profitable firms? Yes. Would we find some examples of irresponsible and unprofitable firms? Yes. So far, so good. Unfortunately, the world is filled with lots of companies in those other two boxes. Examples of firms which were pretty irresponsible, which have done very well. Exxon Mobil, to take the, you know, the bed of environmentalists, the, the firm that environmentalists probably hate more than any other firm <coughs> in the world, actually, um, and also the most profitable firm in the world. Um, and, and we can also, unfortunately, find in many examples of companies which have been responsible and which have done fairly poorly. And the key, I think, is that the relative importance of being responsible or irresponsible to business success is modest. Let me give you a concrete example. Take Starbucks. Starbucks is generally regarded within the CSR community as among, and I think correctly actually, as among the more responsible companies. Um, it pays uh, employee health care costs, um, <coughs> even for part-time employees, which is extremely unusual. 
Um, it makes a very aggressive effort to outsource um, responsible coffee production in terms of fair trade and dealing with Conservation International and made enormous strides cutting out the middlemen, making sure that coffee producers receive more for their uh, produce, working with more co developing countries to get them to, to improve the quality of their coffee to meet Starbucks standards. By any definition, Starbucks, I think, except on unionization, uh, not trivial, um, but except on other definitions, Starbucks is a pretty cool firm, okay? It's hard to imagine on most areas it could do better, okay? Now, Starbucks in the last two, three years, as we all know, is in deep financial trouble. Um, why is it in financial trouble? Because it spent too much on corporate responsibility? Of course not. Starbucks is in trouble because given the recession, uh, some people have decided that paying $15 for a cup of coffee um, is, um, is, is um, you know, is too much, okay? And Starbucks is closing stores, it's lowering prices, its profit its stock price has plummeted, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, the Starbucks, for Starbucks, their level of corporate responsibility is irrelevant to their profitability. What matters to Starbucks is simply the amount of willingness of people to go into their stores and pay extraordinary sums of money for coffee. And the people who are willing to do that, Starbucks profits. If they don't, aren't willing to do that, Starbucks suffers. Let me give you another example of the irrelevance of corporate responsibility, the financial sector. Now, five years ago, if you would have looked at the big banks, Bank of America, Citibank, uh, AIG, Goldman Sachs, and looked at their social responsible commitments, you would have been extremely impressed. Uh, major environmental commitments um, in terms of green building, green investments, um, uh, lots of community development programs, uh, lots of very progressive uh, policies in developing countries. I mean, but if you look at, if you look carefully at, at the major investment banks and commercial, the big banks in the United States five years ago, uh, you would have seen correctly evidence of very impressive levels of corporate responsibility. So far, so good. Okay. Now, these same institutions, of course, wound up making some pretty irresponsible core business decisions, which have uh, impaired their financial viability and hurt all the rest of us. Now, were these firms responsible? Well, at one level, at this, within the CSR world, they look pretty good, but their core business operations were actually disastrous. The two had sort of nothing to do with each other. And the fact that they were responsible, of course, uh, quote unquote, did not lessen the, the economic hardship of their financial, of the financial problems which they encountered. So I think, in other words, when you look at a company over time, okay, um, it's pretty difficult to see what is the relative importance of corporate responsibility or irresponsibility to its financial performance. It is not irrelevant. At the margin, I believe I agree with Caroline correctly, it can make a difference. It's important, it's part of public values, part of reputation. All that, I completely agree, is there. But its importance as a source of competitive advantage, I think, is very modest. And finally, I think one reason for that is that for a company to gain a source of sustainable competitive advantage, and here I'm speaking my business school hat, the way to get, gain a source of sustainable competitive advantage is to do something which your competitors cannot easily imitate. Okay. That's the only way to make money in the long run. Unfortunately, for most firms, most of the time, most of what passes for CSR is sort of normative behavior, which most everyone else is doing. And therefore, if you do it and you gain some slight competitive advantage, your competitors will do so as well. So it may make the world, be well, everyone better off, but its, but it's importance for increasing corporate profitability um, is, um, is modest. And then I think, and I think this explains sort of the paradox is that companies do put a resource into corporate responsibility. Um, they do feel it benefits them. They can cite advantages. I think that's right. But at the end of the day, um, because the relative, the relative importance of corporate responsibility or irresponsibility to corporate financial performance, to their ability to compete and survive in a very, very rough competitive global economy, is so modest. The, at the end of the day, the amount of attention and resources managers will devote to corporate responsibility compared to all the other quote-unquote normal business operations, like moving to low-cost locations, is going to be extremely modest. Thanks very much, David.
All right, now we come to Professor Johnson, and we have a question for you about what needs to change if we are to make corporate social responsibility a priority after hearing a great deal about relevance and the, the many issues that are confronting people who want to be responsible businesses, what can be done to make this a real possibility? Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Sarah. I, I think change is needed in several areas, but I'm just going to describe three. First, I think we need to change at a fundamental level how we conceive of corporations. What are they? Second, I think we need to more clearly understand what does and what does not constrain corporate behavior. And third, I think we need you. <laughs> And third, we need change in various non-governmental venues, there I agree with Dan, where many more and different voices, voices with moral authority, should be speaking to corporate comedy. Now let me take these in order and elaborate a bit. First, we currently think about corporations in a variety of ways none of which is inaccurate, but all of which are incomplete. A corporation is considered a legal person, and it was controversial a month ago that the Supreme Court extended what personhood means for a corporation, but it has been relatively well established since the latter part of the 19th century, but for the most part, a corporation is considered a legal person. Second, a corporation is also considered a business organization, necessarily. Related to that is a corporation also is considered an ingenious financing vehicle, largely held together through private bargain and private contract. And as I said before, these are not inaccurate conceptions, but they leave some things out. First, they leave out the fact that corporations, like markets themselves, are social institutions. The ongoing crisis building on the near financial collapse of, of 2008 demonstrates that little in society is unaffected by corporate behavior, for good and bad. And the people who were affected by potential breakdown with uh, collateralized debt obligations, CDOs, or credit default swaps, were not simply the persons who were parties to those contracts. Through interdependencies and linkages, there was a cascading effect that had a potentially devastating consequence on many who were not parties to those contracts. If you look within a corporation, in order to have productive activity, you need cooperation. That's a social call. You need interdependency. That's a social policy. It's not always fully bargained out. So I think corporations are, are best understood as a special case of social activity. Now, why are they not? Maybe a lot of reasons. I think many social theorists largely ceded economics to economists for good or bad. Another interesting point is that when you see policy making, whether at the congressional level, the regulatory agency level, or the executive branch, economists have a place at the table. Many other disciplines do not have a place at the table. Closely related to that, but I think it's something that we may come back to, so I'll touch on it briefly. Whether or not a corporation is a moral actor may be a metaphysical question, but pretty clearly, corporate behavior has moral consequences. And I think with the emerging uh, of legal personhood, I think people rightly expect greater accountability. We know that a basic tenet of moral philosophy is if you have freedom and power, people will expect that that freedom and power be used responsibly. So I think we need to develop a moral grammar, and we need to, we need to develop a moral habit of talking about corporate behavior in moral terms. As it is now, we tend to move rather quickly from indignation and outrage to there ought to be a law. And we don't really occupy fully that place of moral conversation. <coughs> this takes me to the second area where I think change is needed. Better understanding of what does and also what does not constrain corporate behavior. Now let me start with law because lawyers love to talk about law. But here I agree that law plays a relatively unimportant role. First kind of law, regulatory law, has vastly grown over the last eight or nine decades. We have regulation in all spheres, 
Food and Drug Administration, environmental laws, consumer product, financial regulation, et cetera, et cetera. However, notwithstanding what the regulated think, law tends, as always does, to operate at a rather minimal level. Law establishes minimally accepted standards for participation in a particular activity. Moreover, law is much better at harm avoidance than affirmatively inducing the pursuit of the common good. It's just not something law is good at. Better at harm avoidance than encourage the public good. Another law, uh, corporate law. There is no law that mandates that corporations maximize profits. There is no law that mandates that corporations maximize shareholder wealth. This is one of the great enduring myths of our country. It is a myth subscribed to in the business community among economists, among finance people, among many business students, certainly among my law students. But again, there simply is no law that mandates that corporations pursue or maximize shareholder wealth. Now, if law constrains at a low level, what does constrain behavior? Well, shareholder voting. Because shareholders are the only constituency that has the franchise. And heed must be given to that. Moreover, there are markets, capital markets, as has been touched on. If you want to access the capital markets, you have to give the capital markets what they want. Product and service markets. Toyota is going to learn that with a vengeance. The product markets can punish you. And labor markets. If you want to move on in your career, you have to do what's expected. But Markets do not work, in my view, at such a fine level <coughs> that they completely eradicate discretion. Unless you're selling agricultural commodities, which may be an example of a purely competitive market, you have some managerial discretion. So it takes me to the third area. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me touch on one more point. If law constrains loosely, if markets constrain somewhat more tightly, but not completely, than what shapes behavior. I think social norms. I think custom. I think there's a lot of customary practices at work in the business community. Now, where does that customary outlook come from? I think it comes from lore, business lore, perhaps largely in the modern era coming from Milton Friedman with his famous statement that the social responsibility of a corporation is to maximize profits. If you read more carefully, Milton Friedman, in fact, permits a socially responsible behavior under certain circumstances. He also was speaking at a time when there was concerns about communism, statism, and so on. But his was a normative argument. He was inaccurate as a matter of positive law. Where else do <coughs> beliefs come from? I think they come from professional training. I think lawyers' outlook on this is shaped in law school. I think many business school managers, many business managers have an outlook shaped in business schools. So I think these forces, social norms, business law, and professional training powerfully shape managerial attitudes toward socially responsible behavior. This takes me to the third area where I think change is needed. Reinvigorating a host of non-governmental venues where more different voices recognizing the social and moral dimensions of corporate conduct need to be heard. I think one of the great frustrations of the near financial collapse in the late 2008 period and the ongoing recession is the widespread sense of powerlessness. We feel like observers. It affects all of us. But what say do we have? in changing the rules of the game. For the most part, it seems to be a conversation engaged in between members of the corporate elite, especially those in high finance, on the one hand, and those in government. Many other people feel like they don't have a place to speak to these issues that necessarily affect us. Now, some possibilities, not exhaustive, just illustrative. I'm gonna start with those who educate specifically professional education, law schools, more specifically yet, people like me who teach corporate law, but also those who teach in business schools. And I have two points. 
these schools need to accurately teach that the law does not mandate a narrow profit or shareholder wealth focus. We can have interesting normative debates about what should be the purpose of corporate endeavor. But let's start by getting the positive law straight. There is no legal mandate. Second, I think these schools need to teach a model of a corp the corporation that is broader than the simple agency theory model in which there are essentially only two parties. The shareholders who are likened to principals and managers who are likened to agents. That leaves everybody else out of the equation. Moreover, it is descriptively inaccurate. It leaves the corporation itself out. I'm not opposed to this theory, but I think it unduly narrows students' focus. I think we need wider angle lenses in the formative training period for students to ponder this important institution. Second, shifting quite a bit, religious institutions and religious leaders are often strangely silent on matters of finance and business that touch on human dignity and well-being. In our country and in other countries, vast majorities of people profess to hold religious convictions. And they profess that these convictions shape how they think and how they behave. I think religious leaders, not just in churches, but perhaps in religious affiliated institutions like schools, should thoughtfully address how their religious traditions which have deeply embedded concepts of charity and generosity and prudence and temperance and self-sacrifice translate into the business arena. I think a great example of this is the papal encyclical from last year, Charity and Truth, which I would make required reading not only for Catholic business leaders, but all business leaders. Third, lawyers, very simple point. I think lawyers who counsel boards of directors and lawyers who counsel executive officers should counsel them as to their broad discretion, that they do have broad discretion. Fiduciary duties, yes, but fiduciary duties typically run to the corporation, not directly to the shareholders, another misconception. But while adhering to their fiduciary duties, they have broad discretion to pursue various courses of action that we might describe as socially responsible. Fourth, with a few boosts from these areas and others, I think we need change in corporate America itself. Here, just a few points. I think we need to dispense with the simplistic dichotomy by which we classify organizations into nonprofit and profit. I think, in fact, we, we have nonprofit corporations, but we have on the profit side more of a continuum. Certainly some organizations, you can think of private equity funds, hedge funds, are going to be at the extreme of probably only caring about profit maximization. But there is no reason, subject to light law constraints, light market constraints, in some places, why other companies can't pursue with less zeal the goal of maximizing profits. Of course, they must be attentive to capital markets and other market prices. <coughs> if there is discretion, there is no reason why every company needs to occupy the extreme side of profit maximization. Second, I think we need, from a corporate governance standpoint, clarification about a basic point. Who exactly decides whether or not a corporation is going to engage in so-called corporate social responsibility? Is this a board level decision? Or is this an executive officer decision? If the board lets executive officers make that decision, the board necessarily is saying it's a sort of decision that they do not consider to be sufficiently important to require board action. But that seems puzzling to me. Third, I think we should appreciate the role that a director's personal values have on shaping his or her views on institutional goals. It's a fascinating study, limited to Sweden so far, which shows pretty convincingly that a great driver of director views on institutional goals, that is, should we be stakeholder oriented or shareholder oriented, that the key driver, more important driver than gender, age, and so on, is the director's own personal values as measured by certain metrics. 
I think this has quite important implications for how we select directors, how we recruit directors, and which directors we recruit. And finally, I do agree with Damon that I, I think we have to appreciate that the most meaningful changes in corporate conduct will probably not come from legal mandates. But they will come from changes in personal mindsets and changes in corporate culture where I think there is some room to change. <coughs> and I think appreciating this will allow those of us who may not be in high finance and who may not occupy policy making positions to believe that we have some venues in which we can talk about these issues that affect us. Not only to avoid pathological behavior, but to help all of us who are associated with companies of various sorts to actually believe that their company stands for something besides just making money. Thank you. Cool. Thanks to uh, everybody. And what we'd like now to do is just toss out a question that um, I think follows up a lot on what uh, Lyman just said, and we'd ask any of the other three to jump in and maybe just um, talk for uh, a couple minutes to get the ball rolling, because I think this would be a way to get a discussion going. Um, corporations are uh, regarded as persons in the legal system. Does it make sense to say that corporations are moral actors? Should corporations be regarded as moral actors? And if so, um, I think we have some sense of what Lyman thinks about this. How can businesses and society identify the proper moral compass for corporations to act morally? Who'd like to start on that? Go ahead, Dan. I think insofar as we ascribe moral qualities to human institutions, as opposed to human beings, then the corporation certainly is a moral actor. Uh, corporations are, uh, I mean, I don't, I'm not sure I understand the conception of morality that would wall off different, different um, that would say this is the province of some subset of human activity and not the province of some other subset. So you begin by saying, well, morality is kind of a universal some sort of universal set of, of uh, criteria or judgments, the, then corporations, uh, insofar as we could say political parties, nations, religious institutions are moral actors, corporations are moral actors. I think this is a somewhat dangerous uh, uh, thing to embrace as an idea because in, in some deep sense it's also not true. The, 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 you know, um, in, in much the same way that simply because the Supreme Court says that a corporation is a person doesn't make it so. Uh, you know, the reason why I mentioned Dred Scott was because the, corporate, the Supreme Court said that Dred Scott was not a person. Right? And in fact, he was. Uh, saying corporation is a person doesn't make it so. It doesn't matter how many people in black robes say it. The, the, but, the, but, the, but, but I think we all kind of understand that human institutions, collectivities, uh, people acting together have moral content. The reason why it's dangerous is because it then excuses the actual individuals who are embedded in those institutions from the fact that it's only individuals that make it so. Um, that, uh, and I'll again draw upon one of my experiences in business school. I had a case study on the, on the athletic shoe market <coughs> and the competition between Reebok and Nike in the mid-90s in that market and the pennies that they were squeezing out against each other uh, in that business and the human consequences of that activity in places like South Korea and Indonesia. The professor, who happened to be Swedish, uh, uh, concluded the class and said, what's the lesson of this case? Uh, because, and, and, and people, you know, business school people have all kinds of ideas, and none of them, he, none of them satisfied him. And you know what he said at the end? He said, there was, the lesson of this case is that there are some industries you don't want to work in. <laughs> Uh, by which he didn't mean there's, you know, you don't want to be a, a, a mass production worker in the shoe industry in South Korea. By which he meant you don't want to be morally implicated in what is involved in this activity. So, so the so corporations are moral actors, but only only in as much as all human institutions are, 
And it's very dangerous to then say, well, that excuses the individual, uh, because it's actually only individuals who are acting. Now, how would you then cr create a framework for evaluating corporations' moral activity? Uh, as uh, I think Lyman was talking about, Milton Friedman had a paradigm. He said, listen, a corporation acting morally is a corporation that makes money. Um, it's that simple. I think it's commonplace among progressives to, make, to, to, to sort of say, well, that's a terrible, you know, that's Milton Friedman, he was, he was a bad person or whatever. The, 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 there's a profound truth in what Milton Friedman has to say about corporations because it expresses what, in fact, a lot of people do in the corporate form is try to make money. Uh, and it also expresses a profound truth that, at least in, com in, market, in competitive markets, corporations that can't figure out how to make money don't, don't, don't go on, they stop. Uh, they don't have the capacity for moral choice because they're not there anymore. Uh, and so the, this, is why it's, uh, this is why I would say it is very, very difficult, despite the fact that corporations are moral actors, it is very, very difficult to envision uh, a, a way of thinking about how to engage, with, how to, engage to get corporations to act morally that is, a, that is a narrative about choice. And in some sense, when we talk about morality, we're talking about the idea that, inst that people, or perhaps institutions, have choices. There, there, is, there, there is some ultimate limitation, there are some ultimate limitations, systemic limitations, on the degree <coughs> in which corporations, business institutions, have moral choice. And, so, and, and the way in which those, those constraints are, and, and those constraints can be structured in both directions. Meaning, you can construct a system in which people feel compelled to engage in slave labor because otherwise they will go out of business because slave labor is the norm in that competitive market. Or because, to take a very real example of recent years, there are certain natural gas fields that you can't get access to without engaging in slave labor. And if you're, not a, if you're in the natural gas business and you can't get access to natural gas fields, you're out of business. Right? That's one type of compulsion. There's another type of compulsion uh, which was the kind I was describing, uh, and this is you know, my morality, I guess, is that it is in relationship to uh, workers' right to organize. That uh, there was a time in this country uh, when you couldn't really, as a major business operating in a national marketplace, where, where, where you were compelled to more or less respect workers' rights to, re workers right to organize. That time has passed. It could come again. That time has passed. It did exist once. And the corporations that respected their workers' right to organize in that time, I'm not sure they were engaging in a moral act. I just don't think they had no choice. I don't think there's any question that companies are moral actors, and what enables them to be moral actors is that they have choices. Um, uh, the notion, it is true that companies, um, people go into business to make money, uh, so in that sense, the legal requirement that they make money, I think, is irrelevant. The fact is, most people invest in firms and go to work for firms to become richer. Um, if they don't want to become richer, there are other things they can do with their lives. Um, and they, and, um, and, but when they do that, they do, I think companies do have a certain amount of discretion, including the athletic shoe companies. As we know, Nike has dramatically changed its labor policies uh, in developing countries uh, in all sorts of very impressive ways, improved their environmental performance. It's still in a very competitive industry. Firms do have discretion. We can judge companies, and particular firms behave better or worse than other firms by any different, by any dimension, <coughs> labor policies, environmental policies, community relations. There is variation <coughs> among firms. And, how, then, and that means they have moral discretion. How then do we encourage firms to behave uh, better? Well, I think we do that through pressures, and I think there's a whole world of, of people who follow CSR, inv investment funds, social investment funds, consultants, activists, rating services. There's a whole world of people out there, nonprofits, activists, who closely monitor corporate performance um, and who try to hold companies' feet to the fire. And companies being risk adverse would prefer to be avoided, to avoid being named and shamed by activists. And I think there is a, a market out there, a political market, a non-governmental market, in which people do pressure firms to behave better and firms push back, et cetera, et cetera. So in that sense, I think um, a corporate morality is really set by these uh, public expectations and the company's response to those expectations. And, and those responses vary. And to the extent to which they vary, uh, that means that companies have discretion. And if they have discretion, it means they can be moral or immoral agents. Why would you like to, uh, as someone who once studied moral philosophy, 
I was interested in uh, uh, in your talk about why people should do what they should do. Can you maybe close up this branch of the discussion before we open it to the audience? Yeah, on this question, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, people use different dodges to try to evade moral responsibility. In other years, we know this debate has, has taken place with respect to us for decades. Do we sort of hide in wall uh, to condone, condone or help clients do some things that are unsavory? And, and of course, the, the role is, well, I'm a lawyer. You know, this is what I'm supposed to do. Uh, I think, likewise, I think, I think, uh, I, I share the belief on the panel that uh, individuals should not use the corporation as a screen. I think pretty clearly corporate conduct has moral consequences. Whether it's really a moral actor or not may not matter because it is a legal person. And, and Damon has an understandable desire to try to hold accountable individuals unless the individual has somehow violated a criminal statute or done something in other than his or her representative capacity, they don't face any exposure. They're agents and they expose only the corporation. So I think they, they have discretion, but the corporation, as long as it's regarded as a legal person with authority over these people, will have to bear the consequences for good or bad. Capital One will have to bear consequences. Maybe some individuals too, but Capital One ultimately has to bear the responsibility. So my view is, is corporate behavior has moral consequences. You know, maybe when I'm riding a horse, we can debate whether the horse is a moral actor, but if I drive it or ride it in such a way that it causes damage, I mean, it has moral consequences. You know, in the early 20th century, the debate went on for years, is a, is a corporation an entity or an aggregate? And it's a fruitless debate. The focus, rather, should be on its behavior. And I think its behavior pretty clearly has decidedly moral implications. Thanks to all of you for these presentations and for the discussion. And Steve and I could ask questions forever. But what I'd like to do right now is open up to the audience for questions and comments. <coughs> Go ahead. Uh, this might be for Professor Vogel. I don't know. Uh, I wonder if you could comment D David, could I just ask you, could you just summarize the question since it wasn't with the so mic? Thanks. So it, so it, it, uh, does, the, um, does the Internet actually make corporate responsibility harder because it means that um, people have then access to shop for the lower price commodity uh, and are likely to be indifferent to the social impact of their purchasing? Um, I think the Internet cuts two ways. Um, I, think it, I think you're right. Um, it does drive price competition. Um, on the other hand, um, the Internet also provides a vehicle by which people who care about corporate responsibility can publicize and criticize companies for their performance. And so in that sense, the Internet facilitates communication and also, I think, promotes and facilitates um, on uh, activist scrutiny of corporations and enables activists to very rapidly disseminate uh, some abuse that a company uh, uh, may be engaged with. So I think it cuts both ways. Anybody else like to chime in on that? Okay, let's go on to the next question. Yes, over there. Oh, uh, we I have wanna, a microphone. <laughs> I want to congratulate you on this incredible panel. Uh, I wonder if you could take a moment for each one of you to just comment briefly on this. To what extent do you think our law schools and our business schools are responsible for either moral or immoral corporate conduct? Great question. Thanks. Um, who would like to start that? Damon, you want to start and go right down the line? Sure. Well, I mean, to some extent, I've sort of addressed this in some of my early remarks uh, by implication. Um, I think it's a little hard to know with educational institutions whether you're looking at the chicken or the egg in relation to some of these issues, um, uh, whether the, the educational institutions are reflecting 
uh, the business community that, that, that funds them, that hires their graduates that, and, and, and the like, uh, or not. Um, but, uh, but I think you can tell from my early remarks that I believe pretty strongly that, uh, that cultural institutions matter a lot. Uh, and, uh, and I think that, and I think Lyman had talked about this at some length, and I'm sure he'll come back to it, uh, that uh, institutions of business education, including law schools, uh, have promulgated some, some ideological structures, uh, and, and I use that term to distinguish themselves from the actual teaching of the law, for example. Uh, I, I don't think the corporate law is quite so clear cut as Lyman put it, it in relation to the question of whether, of whether, um, uh, of whether businesses are profit are legally profit maximizers or not. Uh, but I do know that, the, but I do know that that, there, that the, the fiduciary duty in the state of Delaware runs to the corporation and its shareholders, and each word has meaning. Right? And, and I don't, and I don't think most people who come through through a course, for example, uh, in law for business students. Uh, understand what that what I just said, uh, and, and um, uh, I also you know is I, I think I think it's very very telling that at, that at the nation that, that, you know I, I mean I went to Harvard Business School the first day in a four hour discussion of ethics there was it was not conceived of within the notion of ethics that that, that might mean there would be something that you would not do regardless of what a spreadsheet told you right that that that, that, that I, I think that's a hugely important fact. I'm not sure that it can be fixed entirely within the institutions that are contributing to the problem. Yeah, I just say, um, whenever something goes wrong in business, and of course things go wrong all the time in business, um, everyone points to business schools. Um, whenever there are ethical lapses, like during the 70s and 80s, the insider trading scandals, uh, when we had the urban crisis in the 60s and civil rights issues, when we worried about competing with Japan and global competitiveness in the 1980s, when we worried about environmental concerns and climate change, remember years ago, um, and now when we worry about um, uh, corporate financial integrity, et cetera, um, the focus is um, business schools should change and should do a better job educating students. And of course, business schools being business-like do respond to such criticisms and do change their curriculum, and it makes no difference. Oh, yes. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I do think that students are very attentive to questions and issues that we do not discuss in class, as well as by those that we do. And if you teach a corporate law class or in business school, teach whatever class is, is taught, your attentive, intelligent students quickly learn what questions are not pertinent, what issues are not pertinent in that class. Just a simple example, the fiduciary duty of loyalty. Um, there's absolutely nothing in any casebook that really talks about loyalty as we would understand it. That would ever ground the concept of loyalty in some deeper social norm of what loyalty means. It immediately goes off into the usual conflict of interest cases. And so their conception of the fiduciary duty is immediately shrunken. It is shrunken to do not betray. Do not have conflicts of interest. But gone is the affirmative thrust that, of course, we associate with loyalty, which is something perhaps not as, as warm as devotion, but something akin to actually advancing the interests of as opposed to something else. I, mean, I, do, I do think that agency theory, which was imported into the law schools, it did start in business schools, but corporate law was badly adrift in the 70s. It had no theoretical. It frantically looked around, it saw economics and finance, imported it. Agency theory does posit certain things about human behavior, that managers are self-serving and they shirk. Now, that may be an accurate description, but a 24-year-old business law student, and I bet actually have a 24-year-old student turn 24 today, his goal is to go to Harvard Business School. Yo, I hope he's intelligent. But if he's not careful, he's going to make the shift from that's the way people are to that's the way I'm supposed to be. And that's what we have to watch as teachers. We, we have to make sure they don't slip from it's one thing to posit that the world is full of names. It's another thing to say, you ought to behave like a name. And it's our responsibility to keep that.
Thank you. Other questions? Professor Hartman. I have a question for uh, Dan Summers. I'm really struck with the idea <coughs> that one corporation would not do what it has a little right to do. And, and the point that you made about corporations not permanently replacing strikers when they have a legal right to do it is historically it's quite true. But prior to President Reagan's uh, firing of the air traffic controllers, it was quite unusual for corporations to permanently replace strikers when they had a legal right to do it since the late 1930s. That's a profoundly powerful example. And your second one was not taking the last ounce of uh, earnings in the local product. What do you think was operating at a time when there was evidence that corporations were not doing what they had to do right to do? What do you think changed? And what do you think it would take begin moving us back to a point where we don't all do what we have to do with that's a That's a question that will take a while to answer if I do it justice, but I, so I won't do it justice. I'll give you a brief answer. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, you know, um, I, this is, I think, such an important narrative for Americans to understand about our own country, is that what we, is that the current nostrums about business, which Professor Johnson laid out, you know, business purpose about uh, the, uh, about how what managers should do and don't do, uh, is really an artifact of about the last 30 years, 35 years maybe, maybe back into the mid 70s. Certainly no earlier than that. And that before that, there was an entire period, roughly a little bit longer than the period between now and the mid 70s, uh, when there was a completely different set of understandings about what American business was supposed to be about. I mean, not completely different. People weren't. It, 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 it was, businesses were never understood as charities. Uh, they were always understood as money-making uh, entities. But uh, the, but the, if, you went, if you went to a leading business school in, say, 1960, right, you would have been told uh, that, uh, A, you would have been told that your destiny was not finance. Your destiny was to run a large operating company. If you were really good, that's what you would do. Uh, and, that you're, and that in doing so, you would balance the interests of all, the, of all the, the, the parties that contributed value. Creditors, shareholders, workers, uh, suppliers, customers, and the like. Uh, there was talk of the business statesman. It was a sexist age, let's use that term. Uh, and um, that, that whole attitude, uh, which it was the post-war business culture in the United States, that wasn't permanent either. It was created uh, basically during the New Deal and during World War II. Uh, in, the context, uh, in a context in which, uh, frankly, American business became far more intertwined with government uh, because of the war. Uh, in a context in which um, other alternative destinies for the United States were made clear during the Depression. One of them was economic collapse, uh, the, uh, which was a real fear in the business community in the early 30s, uh, absent government intervention. Uh, and the other was kind of permanent destructive relations with workers, with workers who had the capacity to organize uh, and um, uh, the capacity to uh, alter political arrangements pretty profoundly. Uh, it, uh, and, and I'll give you two examples of what, of what drove this change. Um, to give you a sense of what, you know, uh, Carol talked about being made to do things. Well, you know, that's, most of us don't, uh, I'm, it's such an interesting question, it impacts so many things. Most leaders of American business today have a very thin sense, a very sort of unclear sense that it's even possible to be made to do something. Um, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the most interesting and enlightening experiences I had was to speak to a group of CEOs of major public corporations in the immediate aftermath of the passage of Sarbanes-Oxley. And they were furious. They were like up the wall with rage. And the, the New York Stock Exchange sponsored this meeting, so they were angry to the New York Stock Exchange for having kind of been supportive of Sarbanes-Oxley. And what they were really mad about was none of the provisions of Sarbanes-Oxley. They didn't really make that much difference to any of them. They were angry because they were so astounded that they discovered that the government was sovereign and they weren't. Uh, that was news. Now, something similar happened in America in the 1930s. A profound change around these issues occurred from the era, essentially, of, real, of 
of, of business power akin to what it is today in the 1920s and earlier, to, to what happened in the 1930s. And two examples of how this happened. One example is General Motors, most powerful corporation in the world, biggest corporation in the world, 100% non-union. How to get to be union? Uh, the employees of General Motors uh, occupied the General Motors major <coughs> factories throughout the state of Michigan and sat there, basically said, we're not going to make any cars. And the government of the state of Michigan wheeled tanks up to the gates of those plants and pointed the guns at the factories and said, yes, you will. And they didn't make the cars. And they sat there and stared at each other. And the, and the CEO of General Motors called up the governor of Michigan and said, open fire. And they loaded the guns, and they had an injunction that entitled them to open fire, and the injunction was overturned. And that's, that's, and General Motors learned that there was a limit. Now, that, if that, and, you know, they had thought that they would open fire. That had been the history of the United States up until that moment. Was it in a situation like that, they'd open fire. And they didn't. Now, the second thing that happened, I'll just give you an example, uh, was that in 1944, uh, the United States, again, it's sort of ancient history, um, Walmart didn't exist. There were two big retailers in the United States that were national presences. One was Sears, the other was Montgomery Ward. Montgomery Ward was kind of like Walmart. It, it, it was a um, very famous company, present everywhere, sent their catalogs to everybody. CEO was very politically active in Chicago, very famous. Um, and uh, he had uh, been a big leader of America First, the group that opposed the United States entry into World War II, uh, a big funder of uh, uh, opposition to President Roosevelt. And uh, he, didn't re he didn't believe that the government had the right <coughs> to regulate labor relations. And so in 1944, at the height of World War II, uh, he refused to, to obey a bargaining order by the War Labor Board that he needed to bargain with his, collectively bargain with his employees. Uh, by the way, this goes on today all the time. Bargaining orders are issued by the National Labor Relations Board, the successor in certain respects to the War Labor Board, and their, their orders are ignored. Companies say, go get, go get a judge, go, go get an injunction, go appeal to the Supreme Court, we just ignore it. So they ignored, so this guy, very powerful man, ignored the order. Uh, he didn't get, you know, he, what happened next? Uh, the military police district for central part of the United States sent a squadron of soldiers with guns to the headquarters of Montgomery Ward. They walked into his office, kicked the door down, handcuffed him to the chair of his desk, carried him out into the street and took him to a military uh, prison. And, and when they did that, uh, the Sun Times snapped a photo of him uh, and put it on the wire to every newspaper in America. And the next morning, every CEO in America opened up the newspaper, and there was a picture, one of the most powerful business people in the country, handcuffed to his desk chair, being escorted by two armed military policemen down the street, essentially as if he committed treason. Remember, we're talking in the middle of the war. Now, these events echoed right, uh, through our country. And it's, uh, these are examples of a whole set of changes that occurred during this period. But the first one was a change carried out by workers themselves. The fact that the soldiers didn't f open fire on the General Motors workers was not really because the judge ordered the, 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 the overturning of the injunctions and the like represented the fact that the society was not going to actually tolerate a massacre of the auto workers. The second example was an example of the government basically saying, we're not, you know, here's how we're going to handle things. You're going to bargain. If you're not going to bargain, you're going to go to jail. Uh, now, the, that set of circumstances altered uh, the behavior of American business. And so, it was kind of understood that if someone actually, if a major American, a major American corporation actually fired striking workers in the aftermath and during the post-war era, bad things would happen. Would they actually arrest you and lock you up like they did to the Montgomery Ward guy? Probably not. But something bad would happen. Uh, it was what I talked about earlier. It was a general, in relation to executive pay, there was a culture of constraint. So if the actual, the, 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 the term, the, the legal structure was less important than what people thought it meant. The opposite is true today. The legal structure actually doesn't compel profit-maximizing behavior in quite the way that people think it does. But it doesn't matter that it doesn't compel it. People believe it does. So, so, all right. Now, if you accept, if, now if you, if you, if you are interested, as you are, uh, in the question of how do we develop a culture in which there are some stronger constraints. Uh, that counterbalance the great human desire to make money, uh, regardless of the effects on others. If we want that to happen, how do we get there? 
Well, I would suggest that basically we get there the way that we got there in the first place. I don't mean literally. I, I don't, you know, obviously everything has changed in relation to these things. Oh, by the way, how do we unget there? Well, the New Deal economic order began to kind of not work in the 1970s. And uh, Friedman, Milton Friedman, and other people hypothesized that our country would be, would be better off uh, with the more laissez faire order that we have now. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, political circumstances gave, them a, gave that idea a shot. Now, how would, we get back, how, do we, how would we get back to a more, more of a balance? I think we get back there if the public demands it. And one of the very interesting questions about this moment in our history is, is that I think there's a lot of evidence that suggests that, the, that this more kind of uh, classically liberal uh, legal and economic regime has deeply failed our country. Uh, and we could go, and this is why it's such a long question, it can go on and on about what, is that true and what are the measures of it and the like. I, I think a lot of people kind of agree now that that's true. But we don't seem to quite have the political uh, imagination and will, the, and the economic imagination and will, to think about what it is that's the alternative and how would we get there and how would we deal with the, with the entrenched political and economic forces that seem to be pushing us in the direction of repeating the mistakes of the last decade again. And so uh, th uh, that, I think, is the uh, short answer to your question. <laughs> Uh, yes, go ahead. Yeah, wait for the mic. Okay. Uh, this is for Professor Johnson. Uh, appropriately enough, you brought up religion in the shadow of the CUA uh, logo sure. there. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, you know, despite what you know, we all feel and everyone thinks is a very strong history of uh, separation between church and state. Uh, certainly religion has found a way to get into politics. I don't think anyone would disagree that in fact religion has a big influence in our politics. Uh, uh, on the other hand, there is no history of separation of church and business. Um, but, and maybe this is just conventional wisdom and maybe I just don't know because behind the scenes there really is a lot of intermingling. But the, the, the religious institutions in this country haven't exerted this sort of influence over the business community that they have attempted to, uh, and in many cases have exerted over the political sphere. And uh, I, maybe that's not true, but that's certainly the impression that we're given. And uh, I wonder if you could just speak a little bit to why that is, or if that's not the case, or if it is the case, uh, and, and maybe just uh, talk about what, you know, the papal encyclical that you mentioned aside, I think that's an exception to the rule, and uh, you know, is there a place for the uh, religion to exert a, a heavier hand in the business sphere? Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't think there's any constitutional issues here, as you indicate. Uh, religious groups, you know, have been active as shareholders. Uh, there's a very active group of, of religious institutions that try to use the traditional uh, shareholder prerogatives to try to influence through proxy matters the shape of, of some uh, corporate battles. They also have screens. They won't own certain sorts of things. But what I'm more interested in is uh, uh, exercising moral authority, that they do have standing. They, they do have a lot of uh, moral standing with people. And in the spirit of volunteerism, people, of course, can respectfully disagree with your priest or your bishop or even your pope uh, or, or your minister or your, your rabbi, whatever. But I, I think that um, because there are in these religious traditions important concepts that could be used as part of this social responsibility debate, uh, the deeply embedded uh, time-honored conceptions seems to me that religious leaders, those who have knowledge, and the Pope certainly does, I mean, he has many, many decades of studying markets and finance and so on, so he's very knowledgeable. You know, if they would avail themselves of their, of their moral standing and their knowledge and speak, perhaps it's somewhat uh, hortatory, that is, sort of urging, encouraging, but there also can be an element of sort of chiding and scolding that I think we could use a little bit more of. Uh, but I think they need to, to feel uh, free to speak. I think people will listen. Now, how that will translate into particular you know, conduct, I don't know. But uh, it's no constitutional issue. I, I just think there's, there's a silence. It's a norm. It's another example of a norm. 
uh, just as there are very powerful norms in corporations and in law schools and business schools, uh, I guess there's a norm of reticence. Uh, I, I think some people are, are moving away from that. If you look at some of the hostile takeover battles in the 80s, the Church of England spoke to that. So there are situations where churches with influence will speak to the situation. I would like to encourage it. I also think that, that business leaders who themselves, not that they have to because this is purely voluntary, who do have religious beliefs that tell them to value temperance, prudence, charity, and so on, absolutely nothing wrong with bringing those beliefs to bear. Now, the market can sort those companies out. People can disinvest. I don't want that. You see it more in the private arena, perhaps. Chick-fil-A is, is an example that's always taken, uh, trotted out. Not going to be open on Sundays. Well, what would happen if that were a public business? You know, would the, would the arbitragers and hedge funds, private equity people move in, take it over and open on Sunday saying we can make money? You know, we don't know. So, I mean, the, the limit to which you can do it is real. Uh, but uh, I wrote actually in the Catholic University Law Review a couple of years ago an article about uh, the concept of faithfulness, which is, of course, a religious notion, but it also is a legal notion to be faithful and loyal to the object of your duty. And I think if you explain to lay people who are intelligent but may not be lawyers that really this is about being faithful to the interests of the corporation, that is the common good, the business common good, uh, they may understand that because of their uh, religious teachings. Oh, I have to be uh, a faithful servant. I need to be allegiant to that interest. That's a much more powerful way of teaching as a counselor than simply saying, as I said before, don't betray people. So I think there are different examples. Maybe others have different, more innovative ways of doing it. I think we have time for one more question. Yeah, let me uh, ask a question really following up on what Damon had said. I, uh, I understood you to be saying, uh, seems to me to be hard to contradict this, that um, there are, um, there has been in the last 60 years a dramatic change in the um, mental culture regarding business, the ideology in the United States. And I was struck by your story about um, uh, the executives who thought, how could there be Sarbanes-Oxley, you know, why do anything like this? But my question is, in light of the decision by the Supreme Court, I guess it's three weeks ago, in Citizens United, which gives, the, which gives corporations the right to engage in political advocacy, um, what effect do you think this will have on um, the political and ideological composition of our uh, national mindset? Um, <laughs> uh, in a way, um, I mean, Citizens United is about a, is about a somewhat discrete set of activity, which a lot of which um, has been legal already for corporations to do. Um, it, it's, it's about you know, independent expenditures uh, by corporations that were banned under Sarbanes-Oxley, I mean not Sarbanes-Oxley, the other, uh, McCain-Feingold, banned under McCain-Feingold during a window of foreign elections. So corporations are already engaging in this type of activity, just not during a particular time, uh, time window. The issue with this decision, it seems, to me, is very much like the issues that I've discussed at some length about labor law, which is whether or not this decision becomes a kind of a signal about what is now acceptable in terms of the range of political spending by major corporations, uh, the conversion of the vast, uh, the vast wealth. Uh, um, I think you spoke to it, actually the, the ability of corporate the, the ability of corporations to concentrate resources, which is so remarkable. The conversion of that to political purposes. Uh, the, the, legitimacy, the, the legitimation of that. Uh, of that. I, I think it's unclear. Uh, I think it's unclear really um, what the congressional response to this decision will be. I think there are ways in which the decision, I, I don't think the decision closes every door uh, to regulating this uh, activity by corporations. Um, 
Uh, and I also don't think it's clear how long-lived this decision is going to be. Uh, I, I think decisions like it has a, it has the feel to me of the sort of the last. It has the, the feel to me of the types of decisions that uh, the the New Deal era court made that were kind of the last gasp of um, what Justice Holmes said was the attempt to um, the attempt to write uh, social statics into the U.S. Constitution. Uh, you know, a particular view of uh, uh, neoclassical economics into the Constitution. So I'm not sure uh, um, whether this decision is going to be as transformative or as um, have, have the kind of locking in effect that I think you're you're suggesting uh, it it might have. But I think the, re the, the the question mark around it really is a question mark not about the courts and laws, but a question mark about us, right? about us as a society, about citizens, about whether or not we continue to acquiesce in uh, what I described earlier was a model of business and a model of relationships of business and society that appears to be serving us so poorly. I just want to re respond. Um, I'm puzzled by their response to Sarbanes-Oxley because if you think about it, um, American firms um, have been and remain <coughs> extraordinarily extensively regulated over a high variety, wide variety of areas. I mean, the United States has a vast array of environmental protection laws um, you know, in terms of toxic chemicals, <coughs> pollution controls, et cetera, which affect virtually every manufacturing business in the United States. Um, the U.S. has a very extensive set of laws regarding um, uh, discrimination um, uh, on race, gender, et cetera, age, which of course have enormous legal consequences. We have a viable tort law system in terms of product safety and also lots of product safety standards. We have laws regulating where companies can invest overseas. We have laws regulating uh, corruption overseas, et cetera. Uh, you know, U.S. firms, I mean, I mean the, the amount of regulation, Community Investment Act, go on and on. Grand regulation may be more, may be less, you may like it, you may not like it. But in fact, um, uh, we do have in this country an extensive array of, um, of government controls over business. Now, they've increased much more slowly in the last uh, couple, of gen couple of decades than they used to. We used to, you know, from 60 to 90, there was a huge expansion. The rate of expansion has slowed, <coughs> has slowed down. But those laws and rules are still on the books. I'm going to give you one little example, okay? The average automobile in the United States emits 99% less pollution per mile driven than it did in 1970. That is to say, we drive, have more and more cars, we drive more and more, and urban air quality in America has never been better, okay? You know, when I was young, you looked out, you saw smog. I mean, you couldn't, there was this in America where you couldn't see, okay? Well, uh, that all has ended, okay? That's an extraordinary accomplishment. It's expensive, it's serious, it's based on command and control. We have progressively tightened automobile emission standards. We've eliminated lead, for example, in the air. The U.S. used to have enormous amounts of lead in the air, very hazardous to children. There is zero lead emissions from cars in the air, right? No more unleaded gasoline. These are real substantive accomplishments which companies opposed and which they lost but which remain on the books. So I think to view this as a living in a world of laissez-faire, of very limited intervention over companies is, I think, um, a very historically short-sighted. Here's what I'm saying. <laughs> Final comment here. Two, two, three, 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 three <coughs> comments on Citizen United. I, I think it's a great test case to see whether corporate America will uh, simply behave uh, along the lines of, well, it's legally permissible Therefore, we should do it, which is exactly the issue we've been talking about. Will they equate the should with the we can? And if they do, then there's good reasons for us to be concerned about corporate morality. Not because they took particular positions on that, but because they're not having the very conversation that they should be having. Second point, as a corporate law scholar, uh, I think there's an easy way to get rid of Citizens United, which you have to convince the state legislature. You simply make corporations unable to speak. You simply hardwire into their corporate statute that they cannot do certain things. Now, unless the Supreme Court is saying that somehow there is a constitutional right in corporations to not only exist but to have certain traits, when 23 years ago in CTS they made it very clear something they've said since Dartmouth College, which is states design the features that corporations have. And if you want to make a mute corporation, Go for it. Well, 
I'd like to say thank you first and foremost to our wonderful panelists for really giving us a whole lot to think about today. So thanks so much. to Dean Miles for giving us this opportunity to begin this conversation. I hope it's just the beginning of a much longer conversation for our law school because these issues, as I think Steve and I have found it in doing this work, are really very near and dear to our mission of seeking social justice and struggling with questions, that I think Damon put it, of real morality and how that impacts the organizations that have so much power in our lives. So with that, thank you all for coming. Don't blow away on the way home. I hope to see you again in April. <laughs>